All right. Hello, and thank you for joining us as we continue the 2023 Historic Artist Homes and Studios virtual road trip with the fourth stop on this year's adventure, Historic Westwood, which is the home of Adelia Armstrong Lutz. The Historic Artist Homes and Studios virtual road trip is a collaboration between the James Castle House, operated by the Boise City Department of Arts and History, and the Historic Artist Homes and Studios program, also referred to as HAWS, which is a program of the National Trust for Historic Preservation. My name is Mackenzie Dunstan, and I'll be your guide on this year's virtual road trip. I serve as the Education and Outreach Coordinator at the James Castle House in Boise, Idaho, located on the ancestral and unceded territory of the Shoshone, Bannock, and Northern Paiute people. With me today is Valerie Blint, the Director of Haas, Holly Cook, Director of Education and Research at Knox Heritage in Historic Westwood, and providing American Sign Language Interpretation is Lavona Andrew Carson and Peter Boakland. For those of you joining us for the very first time, I'd like to start by sharing how this program came to be and what you can expect during today's 75 minute presentation. The James Castle House and Haas launched this virtual road trip in the summer of 2021, a time when travel was very limited due to the COVID-19 pandemic. Longing for adventure, we found inspiration in the recently published Guide to Historic Artist Homes and Studios written by none other than Valerie Valent. With the desire to dig deeper into many of these extraordinary sites, uh, this, this virtual road trip was born. Fully inspired by the concept of a road trip where the journey can be just as fun as the final destination, both Valerie and I will offer some travel notes before today's speaker, Holly, presents on Historic Westwood. At the end of the presentation, we will host a brief question and answer period. Please add your questions to the Q&A box at any time. We will also share related events, resources, and mailing lists through the chat feature. Please note that this event is being recorded and will be made available online in the coming days. Along with ASL interpretation, English language captions are available by clicking on live transcript at the bottom of your screen and selecting show subtitle. So because this is a road trip, albeit a virtual one, I'd like to start by highlighting a few notable sites that you will pass on your way between last month's stop, the TC Steel State Historic Site in Nashville, Indiana, and today's destination, Historic Westwood in Knoxville, Tennessee. So once we leave TC Steel, we're gonna traverse south and our first stop is going to be in Louisville, Kentucky to tour the Conrad Caldwell House Museum. It is um, maybe compared to, to Historic Westwood, um, another fine example of Richardsonian Romanesque architecture um, found in the region. And this awe-inspiring estate offers a variety of really cool programs, including a tour led entirely by flickering lamplight to explore the site's spookier history and supposed hauntings. Continuing just past the outskirts of Louisville, we'll stretch our legs in the Bernheim Arboretum and Research Forest, where three giant uh, giants constructed from wood and other sustainable materials can be found along a two mile trail loop. Inspired by fairy tales, these massive artworks were created by Danish artist Thomas Dumbo to commemorate Bernheim's 90th anniversary in 2020. And as we continue uh, south and head toward the Kentucky-Tennessee border, uh, you might wanna stop for lunch at the original KFC in the small town of Corbin. The Harlan Sanders Cafe and Museum is not only a place to grab some grub, um, but is an ode to the Colonel himself. Carefully restored and placed on the National Register of Historic Places, you will see this original cafe as it appeared in the 1940s. Before you hit the road again, be sure to explore the museum's delightful collection of Kentucky Fried Chicken related artifacts and memorabilia. So this is a very short drive, just under six hours. So as we near our final destination of Historic Westwood, I'd like to now invite Valerie to share some of her recommendations when traveling in and around Knoxville. Thank you, Mackenzie. To you, Lavona, Peter, and everyone involved at the James Castle House, for spearheading once again this year's virtual road trip in collaboration with Historic Artist Homes and Studios. And I'm delighted this evening that we're going to be introducing an artist in a space that will likely be new to many uh, attending tonight and 
Adelia Armstrong Lutz's preserved home Westwood was accepted as a member of the Historic Artists Homes and Studios program in 2020 with a group of sites representing the legacies of women artists on the 100 year anniversary of the passage of the 19th Amendment, which gave women the right to vote. And so often women's contributions as artists, educators, and designers of their personal spaces remain less known relative to their male counterparts. And so it's critical that we bring attention to these talented creatives and the compelling spaces they imprinted upon, um, which we're gonna see are all abundantly present at Westwood. I often express, for those of you that have been on the road trip before, that part of what is so unique about preserved artists' homes and spaces is that they are intrinsically linked to place, as is Westwood. So to better understand Lutz and the life she lived in Knoxville, any tri trip should be an indoctrination to this region, and in particular, the Smoky Mountains. About an hour south lies the Smoky Mountains National Park, the most visited national park in the country. More than 800 square miles away, the sprawling landscape encompasses lush forests and an abundance of wildflowers that bloom year round. Streams, rivers, and waterfalls appear along hiking routes that include um, a segment of the Appalachian Trail. And make sure to climb the observation tower, which tops Klingman's Dome, the highest peak, which offers stunning views. You might arrange to travel here in June to immerse you yourself in something truly extraordinary, millions of fireflies converging um, to me. Music is deep in the marrow of Tennessee, and one of the most iconic musical talents of a generation was born and raised south of Knoxville along the Pigeon River and is known to also have performed in Knoxville. Yes, the over-the-top world of Dollywood is the top-rated theme park in the nation on TripAdvisor, with no less than 11 themed areas, including um, one of my favorites, Jukebox Junction, um, and is a necessary um, pilgrimage for any fan. But I include it here because I think um, a must-see is to book one of the cabins on this property um, that you see on screen to completely immerse yourself in the majesty of this singular environment and getting yourself in the right frame of mind to enjoy Knoxville and all its enticements. So if you stay right in town and let all the pleasures of Market Street, shopping, dining, and cultural hotspots be within walking distance. And here, deep historic roots can still be felt as you embrace the contemporary. So you can take a selfie at the Women's Suffrage Monument or at one of the amazing murals that grace buildings throughout downtown. You can find some shade in the park near the fountain while you enjoy contemporary sculpture installation. And don't forget to download the self-guiding audio tour that looks at the city's deep ties to American country music where you can discover new stories and places associated with the musicians and songwriters that were either born here or used this city as a springboard to fame. Dolly, of course, but also Hank Williams and Elvis Presley. Many great eateries can be found or just load up at the Square's um, farmer's market. Stop by Pretentious Glass Company to watch artisans, blowers in action or pick up a unique piece. Uh, to memorialize your trip and make sure to stop at the Mass General Store to stock up on your favorite old school candy uh, because you may need it. If you take in a movie at the Majestic Tennessee Theater, when first built in 1908, it was the tallest building in Knoxville. You should plan way ahead if you wish to relish this opulent setting while attending a performance from a theater production of Cinderella to dance, to live music by contemporary artists from Kelsey Ballerini to country music grand dame Tanya Tucker. And you can cap off your evening with a whiskey next door at Glancy's Tavern. Next, you can set off for World's Fair Park in the heart of downtown, site of the 1982 World's Fair. You can enjoy the impressive amphitheater that sits at the river's edge. It's one of only two original buildings that remain. The other, which you also see on screen, is the striking sun sphere, um, which is truly one of a kind. 
You can take up, uh, take a trip up to the observation deck and marvel at 360 degree views of the Knoxville skyline, the University of Tennessee campus, the Tennessee River, and the Smoky Mountains in the distance. And you can enjoy uh, a cocktail or a meal in the Towers Restaurant Bar before setting out again. Also on the former fairgrounds is the Knoxville Art Museum. And there are several floors of sleek modern galleries that display both rotating exhibitions and selections from the permanent collection. And here you can learn about the strong artistic tradition of which Adelia Lutz was a part. And you can view works by her colleagues in the Nicholson Art League, such as Catherine Wiley. And we'll hear more about this group of artists later. But not to be missed are the series of famous miniature interior rooms created in the 1930s by Narcissa Thorne, each representing a shoebox history of interior design. Um, you would need to travel to the Chicago Art Institute or Phoenix Museum to see the remaining Thorn rooms, uh, which numbered in excess of 70. Spring is a wonderful time to plan your trip to Knoxville to experience two incredible festivals. In March, the four-day Big Ears Festival takes place throughout downtown in more than a dozen venues, including historic theaters, intimate clubs, majestic churches, galleries, and repurposed industrial spaces, and it even hosts parades in the streets. A month later, the Jogwood Arts Festival, established in the 1960s, with its hub currently on the World Fair Park lawn, features not only live performances, but a myriad of artist vendors from which to take home treasures. And supposedly, Bob Hope and Elvis both performed at this event in its early days in, I think, the 70s. Knoxville is a university town, and the campus offers its own array of diversions. This 18th century institution is the flagship of the state university system and one of the oldest universities in the country. You can take in a football game at the Neyland Stadium or catch a play at the Clarence Brown Theater, named in honor of an alumni who was a seven-time Academy Award nominee for Best Director. The McClung Museum of Natural History promises dinosaurs, while the Ewing Gallery of Art and Architecture offers vibrant exhibitions, which demonstrate the intersection of both disciplines. Or perhaps you wanna just meander around UT's extensive and impressive gardens. The school is famous for using these landscapes as a living laboratory for study. If you wanna be a little more active, uh, sports events at such a large school may be expected, but Knoxville is also home to the Women's Basketball Hall of Fame, where along with learning a lauded history of the women's game, you can test your skills on three different courts. Or, and of course, there's a photo op next to that amazing like hoop and basketball tower. And now for something completely different. Um, if la time allows for exploring some other places off the beaten path, about 20 minutes outside of Knoxville is the town of Oak Ridge, known both as the Atomic City or Silent City, part of the multi-site, multi-state Manhattan Project National Park. This week will mark the release of the major motion picture Oppenheimer, a biopic about the mastermind behind the atomic bomb. And while he was based in Los Alamos, he did visit the scientists at Oak Ridge. So making a trip there right now uh, seems timely. After exploring the town, including stops at the Science and Energy Museum and the Peace Bell designed by later residents and cast in Japan, you can take respite along the shores of Melton Lake. An equally unique sojourn awaits at the expansive former Brushy Mountain State Penitentiary, a 19th century prison which closed in 2009. And today it operates as a museum where you may receive a tour perhaps from a former inmate, a powerful experience to be sure that you will not soon forget. And public interpretation of former places of incarceration is increasing and becoming more popular. But this site also includes a working distillery, and you can enjoy both spirits and food in the restaurant on premise. Back in Southern Knoxville, 
you should immerse yourself in the city's urban wilderness, an integrated series of outdoor adventure areas, including Imes Nat Nature Center, where you can hike, bike, climb, paddle, attend um, musical performances, or just wander in the woods. And this is all within the heart of the city. Over 60 miles of trails and greenways connect you to a beautiful nature center, pristine lake, dramatic quarries, adventure playgrounds, and historic sites. If you are a historic home buff, as I am, an embarrassment of riches awaits you in this town. And it's likely worth purchasing a passport, like the one I have here, which grants you entry into eight sites and which does not expire. You can practice hearth cooking at John White Fort, known as the first house in Knoxville, or learn about U.S. Constitution signer William Blount, appointed by President George Washington to govern the Southwest Territory, or visit the Tennessee's first governor, whose house is named for the pink marble quarries nearby. Venture to the Ramsey House, constructed by Knoxville's first builder, Thomas Hope, and the 19th century Italianate Mabry Hazen House provides a completely different aesthetic to all this 18th century architecture and the historical society downtown offers a rich traditional um, array of exhibitions to explore. In Crescent Bend, just down the street from Westwood, built by Adelia's paternal grandfather, brings us back full circle to the artist and the gem in the crown, I would argue, of the historic houses in the Passport Program, um, which has made such an enduring impact on Knoxville's cultural landscape. Adelia Armstrong Lips was a woman of many talents, artist, art educator, writer, and influencer. Westwood, like so many Haas sites, is a tangible reflection of all the varied facets and interests of this creative thinker. And as we will learn from our host, Holly, Lutz made sure she had a unique space within her home to focus on her artistic pursuits and had it designed to meet her individual vision. Yet, as with so many artists, her imprint continued to be expand beyond the boundaries of her studio door and can be felt throughout the house. But Westwood also provides a touchstone back to an entire group of artists, of which Lutz was a central figure. So I thank you, Holly, for shining a bright light on her, her talents, and this wonderful place this evening. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you so much, Valerie and Mackenzie, for inviting Westwood to be part of this, uh, part of the Historic Homes and Studios virtual road trip. I am Holly Cook, the Director of Education and Research at Knox Heritage and Historic Westwood. Historic Westwood is owned and operated by Knox Heritage, the local historic preservation advocacy and education nonprofit based in Knoxville, Tennessee. Today, Westwood is the home of the Knox Heritage offices and a museum that celebrates the life and art of Adelia Armstrong Lutz. My time at Knox Heritage started in January 2003 when I, became an, when I began an internship at the organization. Eight months later, I became an administrative assistant and have served in a number of positions over the years. My current role as Director of Education and Research includes the interpretation of Historic Westwood, but also historic preservation work that includes education and advocacy efforts and technical assistance like historic tax credit consulting and national register nominations. It would be very short-sighted of us to think the history of the site we're visiting tonight starts at the moment the artist arrived. Before we begin talking about Adelia Armstrong Lutz and her house and studio, I'd like to acknowledge the ancestral, cultural, traditional, and unceded territory of the Cherokee and the Yuchi people whose land the site sits on today. You might not have heard of Adelia Lutz, but she was a significant artist, educator, writer, and leader of the Knoxville Art Group, the Nicholson Art League, during the 19th and 20th centuries. She was known for her, her unusual talent for copying masterworks, her popular flower paintings, and most importantly, her home and studio, Westwood. Adelia and her twin sister, Lizzie, were born at her mother's ancestral home in Jefferson County, Tennessee, 
on June 25th, 1859 to Robert and Louise Armstrong. The twins, along with their brother who was born in 1864, grew up in Bleak House, right down the road from Westwood. And their father's interest in travel, literature, and the arts offered a cultural upbringing. Here we see a photo of Adelia and her twin sister Lizzie with their mother Louise soon after their birth in 1859, and an image of Adelia's childhood home, Bleak House, in 1895. Adelia showed a very early talent for art, which surely pleased her artistic father. By 1873, the 14-year-old artist was entering art competitions and had already won two prizes. We are not sure if Adelia received art instruction in her youth, but we can assume that with her father also being an amateur artist, he would have encouraged and provided that education to her possibly from private lessons or while, while attending school. This pencil drawing is an example of her young talent and was created in 1871 when she was just 12 years old. Adelia had an education better than that, better than that of most Knoxville girls. As a, at a young age, she attended the local East Tennessee Female Institute and then attended Miss Pegram School in Baltimore and the Augusta Female Seminary, today Mary Baldwin University in Staunton, Virginia. Adelia went on to study art at the Corcoran Gallery of Art in Washington, DC and the Pennsylvania Academy of Fine Arts in Philadelphia in 1885 and 1886. By the time she was 25, Adelia Armstrong was a minor star, earning prominent exposure in bigger cities. She exhibited at the 1884-1885 World Columbian Centennial Exposition in New Orleans, and over the next few years, her work received praise from several major newspapers. A Washington art journal noted Adelia had been overwhelmed with compliments by the best judges of painting in the city. If the highest talents combined with a perfect devotion to art can accomplish anything, we predict for Miss Armstrong a national reputation. After her marriage to local business leader John E. Lutz in February 1886, Adelia taught art for several years while she, where she and her friend Sally Tom, Thomas kept a studio. They offered lessons in painting, drawing, and embroidery. Here we see a photo of Adelia and her students taken around 1887. Adelia is identified by the white circle. Adelia and Sally kept their studio in the Kearns building in downtown Knoxville. The Kearns building was built in 1876 by businessman Peter Kern and served a variety of purposes to include the home of Kearns Bakery, ice cream saloon and candy factory. The building also provided space to rent and was the headquarters of the local Odd Fellows organization. Today, the building is home to two restaurants and a boutique hotel. In 1887, Adelia gave birth to her daughter, Louise, and in 1891, she gave birth to her son, Edwin. It may seem remarkable that a married Victorian mother of two small children kept painting at all but she continued to, and she exhibited at the 1893 World's Columbian Exposition in Chicago and the 1895 Cotton State and International Exhibition in Atlanta. In 1897, she also exhibited at the Tennessee Centennial Exposition in Nashville, and a gallery exhibit in Louisville, Kentucky in 1896 earned her praise as a flower painter. Featured on your screen is the art department catalogs of those expositions I just mentioned. These three catalogs, along with others, were personally owned by Adelia and are now part of the Westwood co collections. In 1897, Adelia was central in the formation of the progressive new Knoxville Art Club, first led by Hunter Nicholson, a professor at the University of Tennessee. When he died four years later, it was renamed the Nicholson Art League in his memory. Knoxville has been home to few literary and intellectual clubs before, 
but the Nicholson Art League was the city's first visual arts organization. In fact, among organizations not directly connected to the university, it's easily the most dynamic art group in the city's history. Unusual among artistic or intellectual associations of the era, the league include both men and women and a transgenerational variety of ages. Westwood has in their collection three of the league's yearbooks that list membership roles, dates of meetings, and descriptions of month monthly lectures. Represented in this image is the 1905-1906 and the 1921-1922 yearbooks. We also have a very rare yearbook from 1899 to 1900 when the club was still named the Knoxville Art Club. These three yearbooks were also part of Adelia's personal collection and today are on display at Westwood. This image was taken in April 1911 in an undisclosed location of a dramatic presentation hosted by the League. It is a very rare photograph of a League event and is most likely typical of what members would have experienced when attending League meetings and events. Adelia Lutz became president of the Nicholson Art League in 1903 and continued in various leadership roles throughout her membership. She attended the St. Louis World's Fair in 1904, not as an exhibiting artist, but representing the league as an observer. She returned to give her favorite club a full report, a lecture on the subject of art at the fair. Westwood hosted many of the formal membership meetings and lectures of the league. For example, in June 1913, a meeting announcement in the newspaper stated, Alfresco, weather permitting, the spacious garden at Westwood is now aglow with many hollyhocks for which Westwood is famous. Adelia was also a writer and public speaker. She often wrote articles about art in local newspapers and gave talks about art to local civic clubs. Here we see an example of her writing, a wonderful piece about her philosophy of beauty. This written piece was featured in the Knoxville News Sentinel on April 17, 1911. Though Adelia may have suspected her days as the star of art exhibitions were behind her, her involvement in a series of major events beginning in her early 50s would have been regarded among the greatest accomplishments of her life. The Appalachian Exposition of 1910 and 1911 and the National Conservation Exposition of 1913 were some of the biggest fairs in Knoxville history, earning nationwide praise as well as visits from some of the most famous Americans of the day, including Teddy Roosevelt, Helen Keller, and Booker T. Washington. Featured in this slide is the cover of the 1910 Appalachian Exposition Fine Art Catalog and a promotional poster of the event. All three expositions made room for art exhibits organized by the Nicholson Art League. They were among the most impressive exhibits of modern art in the city's history, presenting new canvases by Mary Cassatt, William P. Silva, and Robert Henry, and many, other familiar, and many others familiar to any student of American art. The momentum and leadership of the Nicholson Art League made all this possible. Here we see an image of the Fine Arts Building for all three expos. In January 1929, Adelia was honored with a retrospective show sponsored by the Nicholson Art League at the Melrose Art Center. Adelia loaned 14 of her own paintings to the show that covered a wide variety of subjects to include landscapes, flowers, animals, portraits, children, and military life. Here we see the exterior of the Melrose Art Center. This 1858 former residential home was purchased by the League in 1928 and opened that fall for the use of a public gallery and meeting space. In Adelia's last 10 years of life, she often traveled with her family, sailing to Europe in 1923, 1924, 1927, and 1930. 
She also sailed for Europe for the first time on a grand tour with her family in 1907. Adelia continued to paint all the way up to a few years before her death, even though her eyesight had been compromised by cataracts. Adelia Lutz was 72 when she died at Westwood on November 17, 1931. Her family, including her daughter Louise and granddaughter Cecil, kept Westwood occupied and lively for more than 75 years. Here we see an image taken in the 1920s of Adelia and her grandchildren, Eleanor and Ned, sitting on a bench aboard an unnamed ship. We also see a color tinted photo of Adelia with her daughter Louise and granddaughter Cecil in 1917. I'm now going to dive deeper into Adelia um, as an artist. Adelia was a versatile artist and made a name for herself painting portraits, landscapes, still lives, and copies of masterworks. But by far her favorite subject matter was flowers, especially hollyhocks, which she grew in her garden on the Westwood grounds. Her family, especially her daughter Louise, served as her inspiration for her artwork. She also painted her father, mother, husband, and son quite often. She was also commissioned to paint portraits and other subject matter. By far her inspiration for her flower paintings was her garden. One can imagine Adelia cutting roses and hollyhocks from her garden right outside her studio, placing them on her work table and using them as inspiration. This image is of Adelia painting in her studio around 1900. Adelia was not only an artist, but also a student of art and used her knowledge of European and American art trends to elevate her own studio practices. But she also believed that art could boost creativity in the community. She did this through her artistic talent, but also through her writings. Adelia focused on the pure effects of color, laying down brush strokes in a way to create vibrancy. She loved to focus on the main subject and the foreground details in the foreground details, sorry. You see the flowers themselves and the background dissolves, creating no distraction to take the viewer away from the subject matter. There is something about her flower paintings that captures the spirit of nature and beauty, which she looked just outside her studio window and the books that surrounded her for that inspiration. Here we see, see one of her famous hollyhock paintings, which is on display in the studio and is part of the Westwood collection. If hollyhocks were her favorite flower, a close second would be roses. Here we see a still life of roses she painted in 1923. This is a good example of one of her later flower paintings when she was already suffering from the effects of cataracts. But even with her visual handicap, Adelia still produced beautiful paintings, a true testament to her natural talent. This rose painting is on view in our fresco parlor and is also part of the Westwood collection. Adelia also was known to copy masterworks, a tradition that dates to the late 18th century. This practice allowed the artists to set their easel among works of greats and make their own replicas. Adelia learned and honed this talent while attending the Corcoran Gallery of Art in Washington, DC. Her most impressive example is of the Little Knitter, painted by William Adolph Bouguereau in 1882. Adelia copied this work in 1892 and was able to successfully capture the beauty of the original she made sure to pay close, close attention to the original color, form, and the humanity of the subject while making the painting her own. The painting on the left is the original and the one on the right is Adelia's copy. Here we see the studio in 1911 filled with Adelia's artwork, her books, family photos, and objects that inspired her. The occasion of this photo is her daughter's wedding, which took place in June of 1911. You see in this image wedding gifts on display that the couple received from friends and family. If you look above the fireplace, you will see the copy of the little knitter that Adelia painted in 1892. 
Today, we have that painting on display in the same location. Adelia was often commissioned to paint portraits of individuals, but her favorite portrait subject matter was her family. Her daughter Louise was her favorite. Here we see a portrait of her daughter painted in 1901 and her father Robert painted in 1896. Now I would like to tell you a little more about the history of the site. Historic Westwood is located in the center of the Sequoia Hills neighborhood along Kingston Pike, just west of downtown and the University of Tennessee campus, and is set among large residential homes and churches. Today, Westwood sits on 4.5 acres of land with a 1930s serpentine brick wall along the southern edge that separates the property from busy Kingston Pike. Two private homes make up the east boundary, the west boundary is a church, and the north boundary is Third Creek. Included on the property is Adelia's granddaughter's home, which sits behind Westwood to the immediate left. It was built in the mid-1950s and is used today as storage. Before Westwood was built, the property was owned by Adelia's grandfather, Drury Payne Armstrong. After his death in 1856, a portion of the 600 acre acres along Kingston Pike was transferred to his son and Adelia's father, Robert Armstrong. After Adelia and John married in February 1886, the couple lived at Adelia's childhood home, Bleak House. Soon after the birth of their daughter, her father subdivided the property to grant the young couple a 12 acre track about a third of a mile west of Bleak House. To design the house, they hired Knoxville's first and best known architectural firm, Bowman Brothers. An 1888 newspaper article announced the Bowman Brothers had received orders to design a large and elegant brick suburban residence for Mr. J. E. Lutz. Westwood was completed in late 1890, and the couple celebrated by hosting a New Year's Eve party. Land use transitioned from large agricultural fields to a suburban residence with small scale gardens and a vineyard in the back. While the front yard remained mostly open, shrubs and trees were planted along both sides of the entrance drive. A painted wood plank fence was constructed around the same time as the house. And on the west and east side of the drive, the fence terminated at two piers with half dome caps that mimic the heavy limestone piers Flanking, flanking the front steps. This image is of the newly completed Westwood during the spring of 1891. While this is clearly a posed image, I believe Adelia's father, Robert, is sitting on the porch. In the foreground, we see John pointing while a family servant mows the lawn and Adelia and John's daughter, Louise, with her nanny. I can't be sure, but close to the porch, you can see a female figure dressed in white. I believe this might be Adelia. Notice the prominence of Adelia's father on the porch. This most likely symbolizes that he is the one funding the construction of the home. <clears throat> Adelia used spaces around the house and driveway to grow her favorite flowers. According to family and newspaper accounts, she was most attracted to and often painted hollyhocks, roses, tulips, and other perennials. This photo is from the early 1920s and is of Adelia's granddaughter, Cecil, who is sitting on the east side of the house outside the studio. You see the dark colored tulips and the light colored irises against the house. Just over the next 25 years, notable changes occurred to the site. In 1917, Adelia and John's son, Edwin, married and they subdivided the 12 acres and granted several acres east of Westwood to the couple. The subdivision marks the beginning of the grounds as a family compound. Notable changes occurred to the landscape. This early 1920s aerial places the new framed house in context. While the main drive of Westwood remains the same, the established physical boundaries disappear. The family removed the painted fence, which enabled direct access between the adjacent house, visibly blurring the property lines. They also replaced the half dome capped piers at the entrance drive with more heavier masonry piers. 
Large evergreens characterize the space as an informal ornamental residential yard and grouping of perennials define spaces close to the house and main entrance drive. The northern edge end of the property hidden from the street has a kitchen garden and two cleared fields that include a vineyard. A multifunctional frame barn stood between the two fields on the northern edge of the property. The main level likely provided equipment storage and stalls for carriage horses and a brick basement provided coops for poultry. This circa 19, 1920s photo, which happens to be one of my personal favorite in the collection, shows the western side of the barn with a mama duck and her ducklings. Notice the wood post and wire fence that separates this working landscape from the ornamental residential yard. As the automobile became the preferred method of travel and more families migrated to the suburbs, Kingston Pike was widened in 1930. The increased vehicular traffic and noise followed, and the family built a serpentine brick wall along the southern edge of the property to create a buffer and maintain a sense of privacy and reduce noise. The exact date of the construction is unknown, but it was probably sometime in the 30s after Adelia's death. Here we see Adelia's granddaughter, Cecil, with an unknown friend. This is the wall you would see if you were to visit Westwood today. The family members continued to live in the house until the Aslan Foundation purchased the property from fourth generation family members in 2012. Over the next year, Knox Heritage supporters raised over $1 million to restore and renovate the property. In 2013, the Aslan Foundation gifted the house to Knox Heritage, and we began a year-long renovation that included restoring exterior and interior architectural elements, updating all systems, and updating the surrounding landscape to accommodate the needs of the organization. Westwood was open to the public in April 2014 as the offices of Knox Heritage and the museum, which celebrates the life, art, and studio of Adelia. Although the historic landscape has been slightly altered, today Westwood has a shade garden on the west end of the property and a small cutting garden to the west side of the house. Here we see the cutting garden. One of my favorite times of the year is in early to mid-February when the crocus flowers start blooming on the property. These pretty purple flowers have been a staple at Westwood for many years and always make a joyful display for our guests and visitors. This photo was taken in February of this year. Now let's go take a peek inside. This is what one would experience if you took a tour of Westwood. Guests begin their visit by passing through a beautiful stone arch, stepping through a double oak door doors and into the home's main foyer. The foyer was originally decorated with fresco paintings on both the walls and ceiling. Evidence of the original designs were uncovered during restoration and can still be seen. Notice above the door is a beautiful stained glass window. We have left the frescoes uncovered and one day we hope to restore them. The four-year fireplace design features a hunting motif and the grand stair is to the left and features a bench and elaborate stained glass window on the stair landing. Above the bench is one of Adelia's rose paintings. The formal parlor is a sunny room to which to enjoy a visit and features what may be Westwood's most elaborate fireplace mantle. The C.B. Atkins Company of Knoxville designed all the mantelpieces in Westwood. In January 2018, with the aid of a grant from the National Trust of Historic Preservation, Cynthia Woods Mitchell Fund for Historic Interiors, we hired Evergreen Architectural Arts to spend a week at Westwood studying and revealing frescoes around the house and taking samples. During this process, we discovered that frescoes were still evident under layers of paint in this room. 
When studied under the microscope, remnants of gold leaf were identified. The area of study is marked by the circle above the doorway. We don't have any of Adelia's paintings on display in this room, but we do have on display two paintings by Knoxville artist Eugenia Doolin. We also have on display a hand-carved mahogany grandfather clock by Knoxville artist Ellen Van Gilder. Both Doolin and Van Gilder were contemporaries of Adelia and fellow members of the Nicholson Art League. The fresco parlor is the more informal parlor and features fully restored frescoes on both the walls and ceiling. The frescoes were created by artist Mortimer Thompson with assistance from F.E. Austin and O.J. Ross. Mortimer was a fellow member of the Nicholson Art League and a good friend of Adelia's. Mortimer and Adelia collaborated on the designs of these frescoes. This room features the family's 1890 Somer and Company piano and three of Adelia's flower paintings. From the fresco parlor, we enter the studio. Westwood's most dramatic room was designed specifically as an art studio for Adelia, an ideal space for painting. The variety of windows and skylights potentially offer a thousand shades of light. The art, the studio walls are painted in Adelia's preferred color of red. The largest collection of Adelia's artwork on public display can be seen here, along with a collection of antique slag lamps, graciously on view from the Coates collection, a separate collection on display throughout the house. The floor exhibits an alternating wood design and beautiful stained glass over two of the doors, a feature also found over the main entrance and at the grand stair landing. In 1895, a newspaper reporter commented, there is no other such room in or around Knoxville, rich and elegant, and many of them are, as many of them are. There is no room in which one who is blessed with the love for the beautiful in nature or in art can get so much genuine enjoyment, so much pleasure. An interesting feature of the studio is the fireplace, which is surrounded by tiles upon which Adelia painted portraits of her favorite poets and authors around 1900. An unknown journalist described the unusual mantle. An interesting feature of the long room used as an art gallery and study is the large fireplace surrounded by the tile upon which Miss Lutz had painted the heads of her favorite authors. Shakespeare, Tennyson, Longfellow, Ruskin, Emerson, Robert Browning, Charles Dickens, Thackeray, and others smile, smile upon the guests as they read the works of these authors on a winter's evening. The morning room just off the studio was originally an open porch. This area was enclosed in the 1920s to create a beautiful sunny room. Later in life, Adelia also used this space for painting. Today, we have one of Adelia's steamer trunks on display in this room. The dining room hosts many grand affairs. The table you see today was once the studio table that the family turned into the dining room. There are three corner cabinets, two are filled with family photos and memorabilia, and the third with Adelia and John's original French Limoges wedding china and wedding gifts. If you notice, the mantle in this room is simple in design. This is because Adelia was known to unveil paintings in this room to her friends and family and wanted a simple mantle so that it wouldn't distract from her artwork. We have three of Adelia's paintings on display in this room. In addition to her artwork on display, Adelia painted a bouquet of flowers on the wainscoting in the dining room. From the dining room, we now enter the back hallway. The hallway features the back stair, a butler's pantry, 
a marble sink, access to the basement, and a side door. From the back hall, we enter the kitchen. When Knox Heritage took ownership of the house, the kitchen was contemporary, and we returned the kitchen to what it could have possibly looked like in the 1920s. We do have two original pieces of furniture in this room, a wood working table and a marble top table. The family did have a staffed household, which helped in the interior and exterior of the home. I wanted to leave you with one of my favorite quotes by Adelia. Art is something accomplished. It is the birth of a new joy into the world. Art teaches you the philosophy of life, it shows you that there is no perfection. There is light and there is also shadow. Everything is in half tense. Westwood is accessible by guided tours. We offer tours on Tuesday, Thursdays and Fridays from March into December. No reservation is required and a standard tour is $10. Please visit knoxheritage.org or call 865-523-8008 for more information. Thank you. Thank you so much, Holly, for providing a fascinating look into the work and legacy and home and just marvelous studio of Adelia Armstrong Lutz. Um, we're now going to move into the Q&A portion of this presentation. And so for our audience, um, you are welcome to now send any questions or comments or curiosities that you have in through the Q&A box, and we will answer as many as we can. Um, I do want to selfishly start with my own, um, just because I'm curious. So, um, Holly, can you uh, tell us a little bit more about what became of the Nicholson Art League that Adelia was so deeply involved in during her lifetime? Um, so, like I said before, in 1928, um, Nicholson Art League purchased the old um, Melrose residential home and they wanted to turn it into sort of their clubhouse. Hmm. But financially, they bought it, but financially it just couldn't work. And by 1936, they decided to disband. Yeah. So it's unfortunate that, you know, Adelia was so involved in this organization, but just five years later, it decided to disband. So. Thank you. Um, it sounds like part of what uh, Adelia, I have a follow-up question while we get a few more in the chat here. Um, she was an arts educator um, in addition to being an artist. Uh, from what you understand or what research shows, was art or art education something that she did throughout her lifetime or was it just really in the early days of her career? I'm honestly not very sure. I know I have you know, records that she was um, teaching artwork right before and right after she was married. Um, but I, I'm, I'm sure that she was still teaching, you know, definitely. Um, yeah. I just don't have ed evidence of that. Sure. It seems like she was very involved in the community in a lot of ways. Yeah. So there's a strong possibility. Yeah. Um, okay. Uh, an interesting question I haven't thought about from the audience. Um, did Adelia's twin have any artistic talent? <laughs> um, no, and she actually had a very sad life. She moved down to, she got married in 1881, really young. Mm. Um, and she married a guy named James McMillan, who was from a really well-known Chattanooga, Tennessee family. So she moved down there. And then unfortunately her husband died in a fire in downtown Chattanooga. And then in 1898, I believe she died of um, pneumonia. So she had a very sad life. Very, a very different experience. Very different that. experience. Yes. Thank but you. from what I understand, Adelia was very, you know, they were, they were twin sisters. They were friends. They would often visit each other. Um, she just had a very untimely death. Understood. Thank you. Um, another question from the audience, uh, knowing that this home was you know, built at the end of the 1800s. How did they stay cool in this large space um, throughout the home and the studio? Um, they the house has very large windows, um, and um, actually, in the fresco parlor, the windows go from the ceiling to the floor, and so oh. they can open up 
walkway up. And so that created a space for people to move in and outside the porch because that sort of goes along the porch. But um, that's sort of how they stay cool. And they probably hung out in the yard a lot and um, just sort of did everything they could to stay cool. So. I imagine since that the home has been uh, retrofitted with uh, AC and heating. Yeah, it actually was not, it was coal burning furnace until the 70s. And then the family finally got central heat and air. And then when Westwood, when we got Westwood and renovated it, we updated all the systems. So yeah, we have, we have lots of different systems in the house. Yeah, you're comfortable now. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah, we're comfortable. (laughs) Uh, Speaking of those renovations, uh, can you, uh, since you were on site in 2012, can you tell a little bit more about um, what the restoration and renovation process looked like over the the few years that it was happening? Yeah, it was a full restoration. Um, We needed to create, we needed to change the landscape a little bit and sort of create a driveway that kind of, um, ends into the parking lot of the church that we also we also use the parking lot for the in the church and then we um you know updated some of the landscaping um the inside of the house was completely renovated um everything's original in the house um everything was refinished um we had the stained glass repaired um we updated all of the systems um and we refinished all the woodwork and oh, um so yeah we also already. <laughs> yeah. Um, the house, when we got the house, the only, because the house used to be covered in frescoes, even upstairs and downstairs in all the rooms. And so when um, we got, purchased the house, the only, well, we were given the house, the only room that was still intact with all the frescoes was what we call the fresco parlor. Mm-hmm. So we restored all of those. And then as the renovations happened, we discovered more. And so we just uncovered more and more and more and more. Um, so that also happened well during the construction renovation. I, I imagine that was uh, exciting to sort of uncover these hidden frescoes. It was very exciting. Um, One of our board members who now is, she's no longer a board member, Anne um, Bennett, she actually uncovered them. (laughs) She just was peeling the paint in the hallway and uncovered them. And then, and then she was like, Hey, come here and look at this. And so I literally for days had like a little razor and I was chipping away this. (laughs) (laughs) I was like, very carefully (laughs) revealing. (laughs) Yeah, very carefully. And then we were just so surprised by it that it was all still there because we did not know that. That's incredible. From the images that you shared and I imagine the in-person experience, um, they look so beautiful, um, so vivid, yeah. that the ones that you've, you've revealed. Uh, okay, some other questions from the audience here. Did Adelia uh, sell her work during her lifetime and where can her work be found outside of your site? Um, she did sell work. She was commissioned to um, make portraits and um, just different still lives and stuff. Um, And her work right now can be seen at Westwood. It can be seen at the C.M. McClung Collection, which is in downtown Knoxville. It is the genealogy and research library um, division of the Knox County Public Library. Actually, about half of the paintings that are on view here are actually owned by the collection and that are on permanent exhibit here. And we own about the other half. You can see her artwork at um, the Tennessee State Museum in Nashville. You can see her artwork at the Knoxville Museum of Art here in Knoxville. You can see her art at the McClung Museum of Cultural and History and Culture, which is on the University of Tennessee campus. And just recently, um, what Adelia's great granddaughter donated a piece to the Hunter Museum in Chattanooga. Awesome. So it sounds like there's a lot of work to see in um, a relatively close area. So if you are in Knoxville, you can definitely um, be fully immersed in Adelia's work. That's incredible. So thinking about that donation, there's another question from the audience here about the process of uh, saving artworks uh, from generation to to generation, because it sounds like family lived in the home for many years after Mm -hmm. Adelia's death. Um, so they were wondering, were works and belongings already on site? Um, were those donated to Knox Heritage? How did that all, some of that work? 
Um, a number of them were donated to Knox Heritage. So the ones that we owned were donated. And then um, a lot of them were sold. A lot of them went to auction. A lot of family members donated them back. Um, you know, they owned them and maybe like a year later, they gave us some. So it's kind of a hodgepodge. Um, so, yeah. Yeah, thanks. Um, so we, we saw a couple photographs of Adelia in the space and of the home. Um, are those photographs, those historic photographs, part of your collection? Do they belong to the University of Tennessee? Is there sort of a sharing of those images? Um, yeah, so we own copies of some of them. And then a lot of them, a lot of, um, a lot of these pictures um, are also available at the CM McClung Historical Collection, their website. Um, and so it's like um, it's like their digital online collection. Oh, and so sort of a, a group of um, of pictures and images and documents that people had that family members over the past 200 years um, of since Knoxville kind of came about. Um, it's just a collection of like all kinds of different family images and stuff like that. And so they're up there. So the photo of Adelia and her studio is there. Her um, the exterior photo that was taken just after they finished the house is there. And a couple of the wedding photos with the wedding because there's not only Louise's wedding presence, but then in 1930 33, their grand her grand Adelia's granddaughter Cecil also got married. And there's a huge photo of like all of her all of her gifts, which I guess was a thing yeah. back then. I love that. Um, I, I guess in line with photographs, are there also writings that are part of these collections? Adelia was a published writer. It sounds like she was frequently featured in uh, local publications. I'm curious if there's also journals or other writings mm -hmm. in, in your collection or in, in collections nearby. We don't have physical writings. All I have is what I found through newspaper articles that oh, she okay. wrote. But a lot of times we we have a lot of what's interesting is that it seemed like back in the day <laughs> that everybody would take a piece of paper or a letter and just shove it in a book and then put it on the, you know, put it on the bookshelf. So when we were kind of like cleaning out all the books that were left and everything, we were uncovering all these documents inside books. So like we have lots of little, you know, we've got letters, we've got postcards, all of those Nicholson Art League catalogs were found yeah. in books. Um We've got um, little notes, like I have one um, piece that is like, a, it's a grocery list that Adelia, I've got to figure out, I know Adelia's handwriting, so figure that out. She would like kind of start writing and like scribbling and I could tell that it was like an early like vision of or like her thoughts that she would write down for a later article. And so we have a couple of those. So we just have kind of a menagerie of physical things that she would write on and you know sometimes she would clip out articles and like write in the notes of them oh, you know write in the edges of them and stuff so there are um, these sort of sort breadcrumbs kind of, kind of found yeah like breadcrumbs of just um a lot of different little things we also found two really adorable dance cards in books and one has a little pencil it's adorable very cute <laughs> um thinking you know uh about the, the folks who are around her. Um, there's a question in the audience about uh, her father's profession and her husband's profession. This is a um, very fancy home. I imagine they were perhaps wealthier people. Um, what, did, what did they do for work? Um, her father, Robert, um, owned lots of land that he got, you know, passed down from his father, Drew Payne Armstrong, who then got land and land and land from his ancestors. And so that's sort of how they got a lot of their money and they sold it and everything. And then they bought more. They had a huge like gentleman's farm, which they farmed the land and they did a lot of experimental stuff on their land. But Robert was also an amateur lawyer. Her okay. husband, her father, Robert, was an amateur lawyer and also part of the U.S. I'm not the U.S., the Tennessee House also for for two terms. So um, he was also a big civic leader. Um, he would be on, he was for a really long time, he was on um, the University of Tennessee, um, I can't remember what they call it, board of directors, okay, and just different banks and stuff like that. So he was sort of like very civically minded. Um, and her, um, her husband, John, was hardworking, 
at the beginning when they got married, I, he did have his own store. Um, it was like a men's notion stores with hats and canes. Oh, yeah. And like a general that. store. Um, yeah. And unfortunately, um, he had to liquidate his estate about five years after they moved to mm-hmm. liquidate his, his business about five years after. And he sort of picked himself up and, um, started an insurance business in 1898 or 99 and then made like money. So early on in their relationship and their marriage, he was not the breadwinner. It was Adelia because she had a lot of family money. Got it. Thank you. But he Um, was very, I mean, John was very um, successful eventually. Yeah. Just took took a little while. (laughs) Yeah. Um, so I know that your site is part of a larger network of historic spaces, uh, Knox Heritage, uh, and you talked a little bit at the top about what Knox Heritage uh, does in their work, but can you just elaborate a little bit more? It seems like an incredible network of sites. Yeah, so um, Knox Heritage is the historic preservation advocacy group here in Knoxville, um, and we do a wide variety of things. We're a staff of three. We have our executive director, Christine. We have our director of development, Lacey, and then myself. Mm -hmm. Um, We are all a jack of all trades. We're taking out the trash and we're picking weeds and we're going to do presentations like this. So we do a variety of things. (laughs) Um, Yeah, Um, I do all of the, I do all of the education activities and work a lot in advocacy efforts. So I um, put on with the help of the staff, an education event every month, and that can be a lecture or a workshop or a movie. Sometimes I show movies. Um, And then every fall, I put on a preservation conference in October. And so this year, it's going to be mid-century modern themed, which we're really excited about. Um, We have a lot of special events. Every September, we um, we put on a big giant event where we celebrate a preservationist of the year, and that's in September. Um, we give out awards. Um, we do that every May, which is always really great. And then we also list out, um, we also announce a endangered list every May, which we call the fragile and fading. And so it's different properties around Knoxville that are deemed, you know, that need a lot of help and yeah. that, you know, we're there to sort of offer whatever assistance we can do. This is and then, incredible work for a team of three. That's, that is a lot of it's programming. A lot. It's a lot. <laughs> um, it's a lot. And then um, the, um, and then what was the, sorry, what was the question? Oh yeah. Just curious if there, I think in addition to that, any beyond the uh, conference that you're hosting this fall, is there any sort of other programming that folks can engage in? Um, um, let me see. Um, I think right now that's all it. That's really all we're doing right now. There's Amazing. probably more I'm just forgetting. <laughs> no worries. <laughs> um, well, I think as we kind of get close to our time here, we're gonna we're gonna wrap it up. I don't see any additional questions coming through. Um, so I wanted to say thank you so much to Holly and to Valerie for sharing your time, energy, and expertise for tonight's presentation. Um, It really is always such a delight to continue this collaboration um, and not only work with with, uh, Haas specifically, but all the sites within the Haas networks are as many as we possibly can. So it's it's really such a joy. Um, A special thank you to Lavona and Peter for providing ASL interpretation. Uh, You guys make this program amazing and accessible and we're so thankful for your participation as well. Um, I have added some links in the chat for those of you that are still in our audience tonight. Uh, to some related resources, websites, mailing lists, and video playlists, so you can continue your exploration of Historic Westwood, Pause at Large, and the James Castle House through these links. Um, And as a reminder, this presentation has been recorded and will be available within the coming days, and you will get a follow-up email with that recording link. So next month, we continue our virtual adventure in New York with the Rini and Heim Gross Foundation, and we hope that you'll continue on this road trip with us then. Um, Thank you, everyone. And with that, we will say good night.